Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Laveau. The Obama administration and its coalition of the reluctant say they want to degrade and destroy the Islamic State. However, the strategy being played out looks very different. America's war on terror has failed. Is Washington looking for a second chance? To crosstalk the Islamic State, I'm joined by my guest, Majid Rafizadeh in Los Angeles. He is a Harvard scholar and president of the International American Council on the Middle East. In London, we have Ken O'Keefe. He is a political analyst, an ex-U.S. Marine who renounced U.S. citizenship. And in New York, we cross to Peter Van Buren. He is a veteran of the U.S. State Department who served in Iraq and is also author of We Meant Well, How I Helped Lose the Battle for the Hearts and Minds of the Iraqi People. All right, crosstalk rules in effect, gentlemen. That means you can jump in any time you want, and I very much encourage it. Uh, Peter, if I go to you first in New York, um, I think most people would say the war on terror, uh, um, i.e., from George Bush, uh, didn't work out too well, if I can put it that way. And, you know, we had Obama wanting to end these stupid wars, and now, go up to the present, to this year, we have the war on terror, 2.0. Well, if the first one didn't work out too well, why are we going to try it again? Go ahead. Well, there seems to be a pattern in Washington where when something doesn't work out, the answer is to do it again, but do it more violently at a higher cost with albeit better technology. There seems to be no emphasis on results, simply on the process. I think Washington has simply run out of ideas, run out of strategies, and in the midst of a, of a fury to do something, just repeats the mistakes of the past. Look, if you're standing in front of a burning house and the only option you feel available is to throw a can of gasoline in the house, it is better, in fact, to do nothing. Okay, Majid, Los Angeles. I mean, when we're looking at and, and going after the Islamic State here to degrade and destroy, uh, is, is the U.S. strategy, you know, is, is it the appropriate one? Because, you know, we tried destroying bombing extremists into oblivion and it didn't work. As a matter of fact, it got a whole lot more blowback and a far more extremists on the ground. I mean, why is the strategy uh, being pursued against the Islamic State? Uh, I think you're absolutely correct. There, uh, I believe there is a structural problem in the U.S. foreign policy, and this is not just limited to Obama administration, the previous administration as well, that uh, they, uh, the short-term interests or the immediate interests override the long-term interests. And that's what you're seeing that's uh, happening uh, repeatedly. Uh, if we look at the U.S. history involvement in the Middle East, uh, uh, particularly, there have been a lot of mistakes done uh, uh, for instance, that, that resulted into a substantial uh, egregious um, uh, unintended consequences uh, in the 1980s, U.S. Uh, um, arming and financing uh, Mujahideen, which came back home to roost in 9-11. Then we have U.S. Um, uh, US led uh, overthrow of Gaddafi, which uh, opened the, 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 the field for Al-Qaeda affiliated group to operate there. And now we we have U.S. Um, uh, air, led airstrike against uh, the Islamic State, which does not really have any kind of uh, articulate agenda or strategic goal that one can clearly uh, witness. So all right, the, all right, you can me, see all that, these, but all there, these there is something uh, I think, articulate inefficient here. policies. I, I think there is something very articulate. If I can go to Ken in London here. This is exactly what the Islamic State wants. They want the United States to bomb them. They want to be the magnet for recruiting. Recruitment. We've, if you just even a cursory review of mainstream media, mainstream media, the number of people that are going there to fight their jihad or whatever they want to do, this is this is a magnet here. And what is very interesting here is more unintended consequences. I don't think the Islamic State really cares about that, but it wants the U.S. and its allies to trip into more blunders, and that means creating nonstop perpetual war in the Middle East. Well, I, I'm going to make this interesting and disagree with everyone. Okay. Uh, I do not <laughs> accept the premise, <laughs> which probably isn't too much of a surprise. But nonetheless, I, I, I do. I reject the premise that the whole point of the so-called war on terror or investing in the mujahideen 
was to somehow fight terrorism or to make a better world. I would argue that if you really want to know what's happening with Middle Eastern policy, then you must read Oded Yanan's A Strategy for Israel in the 1980s. Now, in that document, which is pretty much being played out to a T right now and has been for many years, there were serious objectives for Israel. And Israel's main objectives were to expand and grow in line with the Greater Israel Project. And in order for it to do that, there would need to be an excuse to justify the expansion of Israel. And in order to, sow, to, to do that, we would have to sow the seeds of sectarian hatred and violence in the region. The number one target of this plan was Iraq. We've achieved that. That's not, yeah. a, that's not a failure. That's actually a success. Iraq is a failed state, largely. It is an absolute basket case. Sectarian hatred is, is absolutely insane. We see the beheadings and all of this madness, and we think it's a disaster. No, it's not at all. In fact, it's all part of the plan to break up Iraq into three different states. When we look at Syria, we also find that the, the goal is once again the same thing, sow the seeds of sectarian hatred and basically turn that nation into a basket case. This is happening according to plan as well. Now ISIS, funny enough, could stand for the Israeli uh, Secret Intelligence Service. Many people are seeing the very be very benef big benefits to the State of Israel, the so-called Jewish State of Israel, by the breakup and the balkanization of the surrounding states. So actually, if you believe what's being told to you, and I just don't know why anyone would believe anything that comes out of the mouth of virtually any Western leader, whether yeah. it be Obama or Bush or any of the rest of them, all of these people are nothing but patent liars, and everything they say is pretty much the opposite of the truth. So okay. I don't accept virtually right, anything good. they say. Okay, good. Okay, Peter, if I can go to you in New York, I mean, I, I, we uh, can make some very good points there. Um, we, you know, we have this uh, um, standard regime change, forced uh, regime change around the world. If you want to go through the Middle East all the way to Ukraine here, uh, and I, I think Ken's on to something there because for the Middle East, it's not regime change; it's region change. It's to reorder the region completely through sectarian differences. Yes, it does probably benefit, well, very clearly benefits Israel here. But this is more the unintended consequences. You can, you know, you can turn the apple cart upside down, but you can't control, you know, where all the apples go, if I can use the analogy. Go ahead, Peter. I would almost feel better, in, in a somewhat ironic way, if Ken's statements were, were borne out, that there was some type of, of global strategy behind all this. What I see instead is the creation of chaos largely by a chaotic American foreign policy. It's been said many times that war is simply an extension of policy by other means. And if there is no coherent policy behind that war, then the wars will simply be chaotic violence. Barack Obama did not bite at the opportunity to get involved in Syria a, a year ago. In fact, at the time when he was ready to start bombing Assad uh, just That's about 13 months true. ago, and we have he backed off arming. as soon as we the first excuse funding. came we to, have to been, mind. We have been supporting ISIS in Jordan, in Turkey, through our <clears throat> proxies in Saudi Arabia and Qatar. There is absolute continuity between the policies of Iraq and breaking it up and breaking up Syria as well. It is beyond naive to suggest that the U.S. doesn't have its fingerprints all over ISIS. In fact, tell me this, why has ISIS, why has ISIS never once, or al-Nusra Front, or al-Qaeda, not once have they attacked Israel? In fact, ISIS militants are getting medical attention in the Golan Heights and in Israel itself. What does that tell you? There is absolute continuity, but the actual well, policy, no, just like the project for a new American century laid out very clearly that a, quote, new Pearl Harbor would be necessary yeah. to achieve this goal of full spectrum dominance, you could never tell the American people or the world, for that matter, we're going to fight wars of aggression where we're going to have to invade and occupy. We're going to have to spend hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars to achieve the goal of full spectrum dominance, which is to control, absolute control over air, land, sea, and space and cyberspace. The American people never would have bought it, so you can't tell them that. You have to tell them a bunch of lies, and we well, see this over what, and what over you have again. To, what you have to do, Ken, if I well, can go, it, it if, would actually I, if I can, okay, okay, Peter, I'll let you reply, but I think one thing is, is for sure is that just keep people scared, really, really scared, and then they follow. They'll follow you no matter what you say. Just show those beheadings. Something must be done. Sometimes, as Peter said earlier, something, maybe nothing should be done. Peter, you want to reply to what Ken had to say in London? Go ahead. 
Well, a couple of points. First is there's no first of all, you'd have to probably waterboard me to try to get me to make a statement in favor of what the United States has done in the Middle East. That's certainly not the point I'm maintaining. And I certainly agree with Ken that America's hands are all over ISIS. It seems to be, however, an application of, of Occam's razor, if you will. The simplest explanation is often the, the current one. The United States invasion in 2003 in Iraq was certainly not designed, and I was there, to break Iraq up into statelets. It was designed to create a client state for the United States in Iraq, and it was necessary to hold the disparate elements together to make that client state as big and as powerful as possible. But I think the thing we all do agree on here is the fear mongering. I look, took a look as part of a, a different project that I'm working on at U.S. propaganda uh, towards the Japanese at the end of World War II. And in fact, word for word, it was almost identical to what our mass media is pushing out today as propaganda. The United States at the end of World War II was using the term holy war to describe the yeah. fanatical Japanese who fought simply on the side of their, their emperor. If you substitute Allah and Islam for emperor, it all tracks. You could simply change right. the visuals. Peter, in fact, Peter, you let don't me, even let need me to jump, alter the visuals. Peter, let Those let me jump documentaries in. had beheadings in them. Let me jump in here because I want to go back to our guests in Los Angeles before we go to the break. A lot of people will say that the, the war on terror 2.0 is actually a war on Islam. How do you respond to that, Maji, in Los Angeles? I don't think I, it's, it's completely would be characterized as a war on Islam. Uh, uh, you can see evidences of uh, what the administration is saying, that it's a war on radical Islam or the extremist group. But the fact is that this extremist group uh, emerge as a consequence of, uh, as a result of the uh, inefficient uh, Western uh, uh, intervention is foreign policy in the Middle East, and particularly after uh, the invasion of uh, of Iraq. So I I I don't really broaden it in a picture that right. it Gentlemen, is. Gentlemen, I, I have to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the Islamic State. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing Washington's Middle East wars. Okay, I'd like to go back to Ken in, in, in London. I, I find the, 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 the existence of uh, ISIS, which was, it's being revealed slowly but surely, and I'm going to agree with some comments that you made. I mean, it's almost uh, be, uh, been midwifed, if I can use a term the administration likes in its foreign policy. Um, and, it's to, and essentially, its first goal is, is to destroy the state of Syria. That's it. I mean, if we look, can, we, we, we see the strikes that are being made. They are, they're, or, okay, they're against ISIS, but they're against infrastructure. I mean, a, a granary doesn't threaten the world. It doesn't threaten anyone. Actually, it feeds people. But somehow, that is a terrorist uh, asset that must be destroyed. I find the existence and the midwifing of ISIS to be so very convenient for a number of people. Well, there, there's simply no question that there must always be a boogeyman. In fact, you're sitting in Russia now. For 50 years plus, we were fighting this Cold War that really was an absolute charade to begin with. There never really was a threat of a Soviet invasion. And for decades, we spent insane amounts of money developing nuclear weapons to the point of really completely, totally collective insanity. And here we sit today in a world that threatens a third world war with a policy that is clearly intended to de totally destroy Syria. Let's see what happens. If we take Bashar al-Assad out of the equation in Syria, does anybody with half a brain not understand that that vacuum that's going to be created is going to be a vacuum filled by the most powerful interests there? And who is that right now? Well, that would be our best friends and allies, these little Frankenstein monsters that we create, whether it's al-Qaeda or al-Nusra Front or the latest ISIS monster that we've created. Those are the ones that are going to fill that vacuum. And that fits perfectly in line with Odid Yanan's A Strategy for Israel in the 1980s. And if these other two gentlemen haven't read that document, I seriously suggest you do. Another thing that's really worthy of pointing out is the so-called Islamic State is anything but Islamic. And yes, there is a war on Islam. Islam is very understood by many Muslims around the world to be absolutely 100% forbidden for you to forcibly 
forcibly convert somebody to Islam or kill them. This is totally untrue. Back in the medieval times, when there was Muslim empires, it was an absolute understanding and policy am amongst the Muslims uh, who were in charge at that time that those who practiced whatever religion were allowed to continue practicing that religion, and they were not even forced to pay taxes into the Muslim empire itself. However, however, if people wanted to practice that religion, they would not be able to derive the benefits of the tax system and so on and so forth. The bottom line is no Muslim, no Muslim in their right mind would justify going in and literally executing men, women, and children simply because they don't convert to your religion. These people are not Islamic. They are creations of the monster, which is the empire of the United States and all its cohorts in Israel and England in particular. And this monster is purposely created to justify the continuing insanity of the never-ending war policy, which is really the core of America. And that is exactly why I renounced my US citizenship. This madness cannot be considered anything but the major threat to the world. Okay, Peter, in New York, one of the things we've seen on, in reference to this war on terror is that, you know, whatever group you empower, and I don't care what label you put on it, uh, it's hard to turn them off. And this is what I worry about, is that I agree what we heard. I mean, if Assad goes, I mean, what makes you think it's going to be better? I, I've never understood that argument here. But, you know, you have to look at the Saudis and the Gulf countries that have been feeding this, this quote-unquote monster. I like that word. How do you turn turn this, you know, you turn off the money. I don't see that happening. I don't see that the that Saudi Arabia has any interest in pursuing an American agenda. It pursues its own interest. And, and, and that could be applied to Israel as well. What I worry about is that, you know, it just continues to un, uh, uh, unseat and destroy everything that is stable in the, in the Middle East. Not that I'm, you know, would be unhappy to see the Saudi regime go. You know, you've hit on, on the exact point. If you want to look at Syria's future, all you have to do is glance over at, at what happened in, in Libya. Yeah. The United States removed one regime and replaced it with essentially nothing. It created yep. a power vacuum that resulted in, in, in Benghazi, resulted in the flow of arms all across uh, northern Africa and, and into <clears throat> Syria as well. As far as the Saudis, and, and, the, and we see it most clearly these days with the Turks, the United States fails, horribly fails, to understand that each of these countries has its own interests. Some of those interests overlap with what the United States is trying to do. Take a look at the fact that America is now acting as Iran's air force <laughs> on the ground in Iraq. But we don't understand yeah. the difference between occasional overlapping interests and the broader strategic goals. That is what bites us in the rear end every single time in the Middle East. And I shake my head watching it unfold in front of us today in both Syria and Iraq. And I wonder what will happen next. Which will be the next domino, to that use a phrase from the generous, Vietnam War extremely era, extremely generous to, to these fall psychopaths next. who are running the world right now okay, to uh, say that they're just making mistakes. Okay, I agree, Ken. Let me go to Los Angeles well, here. Well, I try to I try to be polite. <laughs> okay, it's a family let, let, show. okay, let's let's go to Los Angeles here. We heard about the uh, the United States functioning essentially as Iran's air force uh, uh, in dealing with ISIS. How do you feel about that? Because you know the Americans just have this thing with Iran, you know, and they're just they just can't let it go. They you can't let it go. This is an opportunity to change history. Do you think there's going to be any smarts in Washington to say, look, we can work with these people. They have a commitment to see this, this uh, ISIS be put, put under control, degraded and destroyed. Do you think the Americans will ever get to the point to say, yes, we can work with the Iranians? We know they are, but they won't be honest with us. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of contradictions when it comes to U.S. foreign policy towards Iran, particularly, for instance, the, uh, the ar arms in embargo, which doesn't have to do anything with the nuclear issue. And if you want Iran to really, Iran is the only country that you can see in the Middle East that is fighting uh, yes. with the Islamic State, ha putting troops on yep. the ground. So if you want this country to fight really with the Islamic State, so why do you impose uh, other uh, arms embargo on the country? So there are a lot of, uh, I think, contradictions. But if I can add a point just uh, to uh, what uh, your guest said, I, I agree that it, there is some kind of effort to demonize Islam, but I think the war is really more on resources and it's more geopolitics uh, and uh, the, whatever is really furthering U.S. national interest, that's what uh, the administration uh, would follow because you see the administration is, is allied with, I mean, some of the most powerful Muslim Islamic governments um, uh, in, in, in the region. So I think there 
is an effort to demonize Islam in the mainstream uh, media, particularly in the Western media. Uh, but uh, when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, Western foreign policy, if, uh, it's been always uh, what is in, the, in, in their national interest uh, 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 rather than the interest of the people uh, in the region. And you can see now the, 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 the airstrike, the coalition airstrike is, uh, is, is really um, hurting mostly the, the civilians on the ground. Uh, the number of refugees has, has increased, and this is the, the, uh, some of the several civilians have been killed, uh, and the, what they call unintended consequences of the war. And this, these, are, these are already reported in Reuters uh, news agency. So it's, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, at the end of the day, are uh, Syrian people who are really suffering in the middle. Okay, Ken, Ken, where do we go from here? Because, you know, it, you know, from Washington and Langley, it just kind of, it probably looks like a computer game with their drones and all of that there. But, I mean, it, it, to what extent, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is the ultimate uh, regime change, and that's going to be the Gulf countries here, because I, you can't turn these people off. They have their arms. It's remarkable. Everybody in this conflict has the same arms. Everybody's buying them from one or, or a few countries here. I mean, this is a really closed network here. But, you know, the Saudis better be worried because they're creating something that's going to go after them because a lot of people say that they don't represent uh, Islam. You know, it's no mistake in my mind that the Islamic State calls itself the Islamic State because Saudi Arabia doesn't live up to its reputation. Go ahead. Well, th there, there are very obvious solutions. One is to arrest the traitors in the U.S. Congress and White House who have sworn to uphold the U.S. Constitution. And somehow the American people have sat by while the president has afforded himself the power to execute anyone, anywhere, anytime for any American citizen to be tamed without any due process of law, no representation, incognito, and theoretically he could be condemned to death by a military tribunal in secret and executed. All of this operating under supposedly the United States Constitution. So all of these traitors need to be arrested first and foremost. When Netanyahu came to the Congress a couple years back, he received 29 standing ovations by these cowardly chicken hawk traitors. So the American patriots need to stand up and grab a pair and ultimately have some integrity and get rid of these uh, traitors. Secondly, cut off all funding to Israel. Israel is a pariah state, a criminal state. It is committing active policies of genocide by the legal definition of the word according to Black's Law Dictionary. That country needs to be cut off right now. All of their attention needs to turn inward. Stop your little empire endeavors and full spectrum dominance and all of this sort of madness. Start taking care of your infrastructure back home. Start taking care of the American citizens who have worked their whole lives and now find themselves wondering how they're going to keep a roof over their head. All of that is very obvious and very sensible. Or America can continue to decline into an absolute total pariah state, hated and resented around the world, and maybe bring the whole world into World War III. I would prefer that we do the former instead of the latter, but ultimately we need some serious change in government, and that means getting rid of these traitors. Okay, M Majid, what, what's it going to take for, in Los Angeles, what's it going to take for the United States to change its foreign policy? Because I think all of us here have, have agreed that it, you know, it's not making any kind of progress. It keeps repeating the same mistakes over and over again with the wrong array of allies. Well, I, I, I don't think, I, the, you know, the, the military uh, and the corporations' uh, interests are so embedded in U.S. Uh, foreign policy that I don't, I'm not really optimistic that it's going to fundamentally uh, change. Um, uh, but I will have to add one uh, thing to what uh, just uh, your guest said. I think uh, what should be done is also stop, I think, uh, supporting countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and being allied with these countries, which are one of the major factor in uh, emergence of uh, the Islamic State, uh, and Jubhat Israel. al-Nusra, or other, uh, other, other, right. uh, other... I got, I got 20 yes, seconds and, left. And I want to go to Peter other, in New York. Groups, so. Peter, I want to give you the last 20 seconds. Go ahead, in New York. The way to solve the problems in the Middle East are through regime change. The way I differ is that the regime change should take place in Washington, not somewhere else. <laughs> Excellent ending to this program. Thanks to my guests here in Los Angeles, New York, and in London. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, cross talk.